Hello, welcome back to Metal Machine Shop. In this video I'm going to be taking a closer look at the tilting, three-wheeled, streamlined velomobile design that I've been working on. If you looked at my last video you might remember that I talked about the tilting mechanism and my ideas for that. Um, well now I've moved things forward a bit, I've started to commit the design to CAD, so I'm going to be taking you through some of the finer points of the detail behind the design. The design is just a schematic at this stage, I've still got to work through the detail, um, so that will be coming together over the coming weeks. Uh, but I just wanted to go through some of the main ideas um, and to talk about the progress of the design, particularly how the tilting mechanism is starting to work out. Um, first and foremost, the, the machine is designed to be aerodynamic to give you a faster speed for the same power input. I've gone for a reverse trike, so that means the two steering tilting wheels in the front and a single central wheel at the back. I want the design to be as practical as possible. This isn't really intended to be a racing machine, uh, so I had in mind something that's more suitable for commuting or touring, you know, particularly where the weather's cold and wet and you want a bit of shelter. I want the Velomobile to be as light and practical as possible, even if that means making compromises on some of the more perfect uh, areas of the design solution. And I want something that's easy and cheap to build in a normally reasonably well-equipped home workshop. So let's have a look at the general arrangement. The rider is an approximately scale model of me. I am 180 centimetres tall and quite skinny. The riding position is quite laid back with the spine at 45 degrees. In terms of the position of the legs relative to the body, it's about the same as riding on the drop bars on an upright bike but rotated backwards. The line of sight is slightly above the knees. The bottom bracket, or top bracket I guess you might say, is here and it can be moved backwards by about 150 millimetres to provide adjustment for shorter riders. The seat can also slide back and forwards to give further adjustment. The hands are in a relaxed position by the rider's thighs. I did think about having a sort of steering wheel with the steering column running down the centre line of the bike, but this would need to be behind the knees for clearance and would bring the hands well back, giving an uncomfortably cramped arm position. It would also make it much more difficult to get in and out of the machine. The overall length is about 2.5 metres and the width is just under 800 millimetres. The front wheel track is 740 millimetres. Ground clearance is greater than typical non-tilting velomobiles and this is necessary to avoid the body contacting the ground under high lean angles. I went for 20 inch wheels front and back. At the front this size of wheel allows the necessary clearance against the body for the steering. In fact the turning circle is about a 4 metre radius which is much better than a quest type velomobile. The 20 inch wheel at the back allows for a shorter wheelbase and shorter overall length than a 26 inch wheel would with greater clearance for the suspension travel, a less acute chain angle and much greater internal volume for luggage. Here you can see what a 26 inch wheel would look like and how much of a difference there is with the smaller wheel. The smaller wheel will need a larger chain ring at the front though to give the correct gear ratios. Compared to the Quest the weight distribution is more over the rear wheel and as the front wheels are much further forward rather than around the rider's knees as they are on the Quest. This should give more traction on the rear wheel and the longer wheelbase should give better longitudinal stability. The Quest has a lot of side area forward of the front wheels which apparently is unstable in strong side winds. My design will hopefully be a bit better in this regard. The body shape in profile is as streamlined as possible but is not quite the ideal aerofoil shape as the thickest point is about halfway back. It needs to be quite pointy at the front. In side view this is to give the required clearance for the lower wishbone and the steering wheels. In plan view it gives the clearance for the steering. Other than that the body shape just needs to clear the rider allowing for riders with broader hips and shoulders than me. The canopy can be more aerofoil shaped in plan view. The swept arc of the rider's toes and heels will protrude beyond the basic shape of the body so will have to be accommodated by fairings or maybe even holes at the bottom. Some ventilation will be needed after all. I haven't yet decided whether to go for a full fairing or a partial fairing. This is the basic design for the frame. I've just shown it as a box section at this point. It could be a fabrication from thin walled steel or I might make it a carbon fibre moulding integrated with the body. It is formed as a single spine. The section at the front is shaped to accommodate the adjustable bottom bracket. It may need to be triangulated for strength and at the front are the mounting points for the tilting arms. The back end is cranked slightly to accommodate the swing arm hinge whilst clearing the chain. This is a typical arrangement for a suspension bike. There is a simple swing arm at the back to give a few centimetres of travel. 
I haven't yet modelled the shock, but it will be as simple as possible, maybe just a rubber pad to keep the weight down. As with most recumbents, the drive chain is comparatively complex as the long chain needs to be routed under the rider's backside to the wheel. This is via two idlers positioned forward and aft of the seat. The derailleur could be tilted forward slightly to give more ground clearance, as it is quite close to the ground with a 20 inch wheel. The chain then runs back to the chain ring, guided by further idlers. I may include an extra loop to give simple adjustment when moving the bottom bracket. At this point I just want to give a shout out to the Phil Plays YouTube channel for letting me use this fairly sophisticated computer equipment behind me. Uh, you can catch a link to the channel in the description down below or on the screen. So let's now have a closer look at the tilting and steering mechanism which is at the heart of this design. The main components are the top and bottom arms or wishbones, fixed side brackets and the swivelling steering brackets. In my earlier video I said that the top arm would take the load, but I've changed my mind and it's now the bottom arm. For simplicity there will be no shock absorber, but the cantilevered load bearing bottom arm will be designed to flex slightly to give a degree of shock absorption. The top arm is in fact made of two pieces which are hinged in the middle. The top arm hinge is positioned on the body centerline, the body being circular in cross section at this point. And the arms pass through the slots in the body whilst the bottom arm's hinge is outside the body to give the necessary clearance. The side brackets are fixed to the horizontal arms by simple hinges. These carry the swivelling steering brackets to which the wheel and brake calipers are mounted. The fixed brackets will either be fabrications from thin steel or carbon fibre mouldings. The swivelling brackets might be machined from aluminium billets or fabrications. At this point the designs for the fixed and swivel brackets are indicative only and have not been optimised. To explain how this works, let's have a look at the tilting and steering geometry in the front and side views. In the front view, the tilting arms and the fixed brackets form a rectangular shape. This diagonal line here is the kingpin axis about which the swivelling bracket rotates. The kingpin axis is angled at 8 degrees from the vertical. This angle is arrived at by allowing sufficient clearance between the various parts and, the inter and intersecting close to the centre of the tyre contact patch to minimise bump steer, which is when bumps are felt through the handlebars as the wheel is pulled to one side. I have in fact allowed a small offset of 10mm, which should give slightly lighter steering at very low speeds and also helps with clearances. In side view, the swivel bracket steering axis is angled at 73 degrees from the horizontal, giving the rake angle, and there is 45 millimetres of trail, which is the distance between the point at which the swivel axis intersects the ground in front of the vertical line from the wheel's centre line. This geometry is the same as a standard road bike and will give a natural self-centering or castering action. The axis about which the swivel bracket pivots is therefore aligned with the kingpin axis in front view and the rake axis in side view. Because of the rake angle, the top arms need to be swept back at quite an angle whilst the bottom arms are straighter. Moving on to the wheels, I haven't modelled the wheel spokes obviously. The wheels are fairly standard and have 120mm diameter brake discs. These appear to be the smallest commercially available discs, but since there are two of them at the front and another at the back, stopping should not be a problem. The swivel brackets will also carry the brake calipers here and the steering linkages. As I said, the handlebars are positioned by the rider's thighs. The left and right bars are separate and pivot about a horizontal axis. I haven't shown the details yet, but this will probably be a fly-by-wire design with the steering operated by cables rather than pushrods. I will explain the reasons for this in more detail in a future video. And this is the assembly of all the parts that I've modelled so far. Um, quite simple, I've tried to reduce the number of components as far as I possibly can, although there's still quite a few more to go on here that I've not drawn as yet. Um, you can see how it looks in the side view. The rear suspension works just like that. I haven't shown the spring yet, but I'll get around to doing that. Uh, handlebars, again as one goes back the other will go forwards, pedals even go around, look at that. Uh, and then the most interesting bit really at the front is the tilting mechanism, I go to the front view, so it works just like that. And when I've finished modelling the steering mechanism you'll be able to see how the steering interacts with the tilting mechanism. So 
So that's basically where I've got to so far. Um, next time I'm going to be looking at the Ackerman steering mechanism in more detail. I've been doing a bit of work on that in the background. Um, not easy to get it to work with the tilting mechanism, as I'm sure you can understand. Um, I'm going to explain about the tilt lock. So unless you stick your feet through the bottom of the machine, you're going to have to have a tilting lock for when you're stopped at traffic lights. Um, talk a bit more about the rear suspension and you know, hopefully how I've evolved the design and made it a little bit slicker. I hope that was interesting. Um, if it was, please like and subscribe to the channel for check back later for more. Let me know if you've got any comments. I'm keen to know your thoughts on bits that I've got right or wrong or where you think things might be able to be improved. Thank you for watching and see you next time.